So welcome uh, to this uh, tools and technique uh, dedicated to the new Evolute Proplus uh, platform. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting uh, session about this uh, new uh, device. My name is uh, Didier Cheche, and I have the great uh, privilege to uh, share this uh, uh, session with uh, friends of mine. Uh, so we have Dan uh, Blackman. Hi, Dan. Hi, Didier. We have Tanya Rudolph. Hi, Tanya. Hi. And Azim, Azim uh, Latib, that you all know. Hi, Azim. Hi, everybody. Uh, so the, the TNT uh, today is going to be uh, is going to be built around a, a recorded case that we're going to see, uh, showing all the uh, advantages of the uh, Evolute Pro Plus uh, platform. Uh, so uh, what are the uh, learning objectives uh, today? So maybe we can uh, uh, pop up the, the slide. Uh, so uh, uh, today, what we uh, we will try to uh, to aim at is uh, first to explore the benefits of the new Evolute Pro Plus platform uh, and uh, explore its uh, versatility to treat different uh, patients' uh, anatomies. Uh, we've seen a bike speed uh, case that was uh, performed uh, two uh, hours uh, ago, and we're going to see how it performs in more uh, regular anatomy. Uh, one of the uh, the second objective is to uh, try to understand how, how the cusp overlap, the combination of the cusp overlap technique, and the commissural alignment, more contemporary techniques dedicated to this platform uh, can help to ensure optimal outcomes and future coronary arterial access uh, for our patients. And at last, uh, uh, we will try to, uh, to discuss the benefits of that platform that we know, that self-expanding supraannular platform uh, in low-risk patients, because this is uh, one of the last indications, apart from bike speed uh, patients. The low-risk indication is uh, one of the, uh, the most uh, recent indication for uh, TAVI uh, in uh, general. So uh, I would like to, uh, to remind you that this uh, remains uh, an interactive session, so I strongly encourage you to uh, populate your questions through the, cha the chat, and we will uh, answer them uh, during uh, that uh, TNT. So uh, the chat master is uh, Sonia. Hi, Sonia. Sonia Petronio, and she's going to answer your questions, and uh, uh, we, we're going to bring some of them uh, live just to, uh, to discuss uh, them. So I guess we can uh, start. We're going to start with you, uh, Dan. Uh, you have, uh, you're going to drive us through the, uh, the features of the Evolute Pro Plus, and we're going to understand more about the architecture of that platform, what it brings uh, uh, in terms of novelties. Uh, so uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dan, uh, for your lecture on the Evol Evolute Pro Plus uh, design. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to the organisers of EuroPCR and to Medtronic for inviting me to give this short talk on the Evolute Pro Plus valve iteration and the design advancements that will make a difference. My name is Dan Blackman. I'm an interventional cardiologist and TAVI operator from Leeds in the UK. These are my potential conflicts of interest. So as you know, we've seen a number of iterations of the core valve Evolute platform over the years since we started TAVI. We started off with the core valve system delivered via an 18 French sheath and not repositionable or recapturable. The first big development was Evolute R. This gave us repositionability through recapturability and the introduction of a sheathless approach, which meant we were down to a 14 French equivalent and could treat patients with vessel diameters as low as five millimeters. This came in the four sizes shown on this slide. With Pro, a number of years ago, there was the addition of an external pericardial wrap as well as the inner skirt, mitigating paravalvular leak with demonstrable improvements in PVL outcomes. But this was at the price of a slight increase in caliber of the capsule, which translated to an increase in the necessary vessel diameter to 5.5 millimeters, slightly changing the number of treatable patients. So what do we have with Pro Plus that we're talking about in this session today? Two key changes. Firstly, the addition of the pericardial wrap to the 34 millimeter valve. And secondly, the reduction in the caliber of the outer uh, of the capsule, which is now down back to 6.0 millimeters, meaning we can again treat patients with the three smaller valve sizes with vessel diameters as low as five millimeters. So if we look first at the frame, the only change with Evolute Pro Plus is the addition of the pericardial wrap to the 34 millimeter size. There's no change in the other valves. There's no change with any of the valves in the frame or the inner tissue. 
As a reminder, this external wrap covers the first one and a half inflow cells or diamonds um, and extends to the base of the frame, giving around 14 millimetres, varying slightly from uh, valve to valve size. We already have data and these are being presented at this conference for the first time and are available for you online from the TVT registry, showing that this pericardial external wrap does translate to reduced PVL. These data are across all valve sizes from the US TVT registry, where the uh, ProPlus system has been available for some time. And if you look at the right hand panel, you can see when we compare ProPlus to Evolu R, this is with one month site performed and reported echocardiogram, that there's a highly significant reduction in mild PVL, an increase in none or trivial PVL. No change in the very small 2% of patients with moderate or more. What about the reduction in the size, the diameter of the capsule? How has this been achieved? This is a cross-section of the capsule. Now you can see the capsule consists of a nitinol frame, which provides support. Previously, both on external and internal to the nitinol capsule was a silithane layer. And this provides flexibility, which aids in uh, deployment and recapture. And what's changed with Pro Plus is the replacement of the inner silithane layer with a PTFE capsule liner. This has much lower friction and essentially means you can sit, fit the same sized valve into a smaller space. So the only thing that's changed in, in, in size, in diameter, is the lumen. The thickness of the wall of the capsule, if you like, is the same, but the reduced friction of the PTFE inner liner means you can fit the same sized valve into a smaller space. So if we look at this in detail, this means that with the three sizes, 23, 26, 29, the capsule outer diameter has changed from 6.7 to 6.0. This means we can treat patients with vessel diameters down to 5.0. With the 34 millimeter valve, the addition of the pericardial wrap actually means an increase in outer capsule to 6.7 to 7.3. I mean, we can treat patients down to 6.0 millimetres, 18 French, so a slight increase in size. But these are, of course, generally larger patients with larger access vessels. What does this mean for our patients and for our practices? Well, these are data from the Evolute Low Risk and Satavi trials. And they show that around 10% of patients uh, being treated with 23, 26, 29 valves had vessel sizes between 5 and 5.5. These patients previously required the Evolute R system because they needed 14 French equivalent. But now this is another 10% of patients that can benefit from the pericardial wrap and the Pro Plus. So in conclusion, with Pro Plus, we have a reduced capsule diameter for the three smaller sizes, reducing the required vessel diameter five to 5.0 millimeters, increasing the number of treatable patients, and should also translate to reduced risk of vascular access complications across the board. The 34 valve now benefits from the pericardial wrap and early data confirm what we'd expect, that this translates to reduced paravalvular leak and better outcomes for our patients. So thank you for your attention and we'll look forward to moving on to the recorded case demonstrating a ProPlus valve in action. So thank you very much, uh, Dan. This was a clear overview of the features, the novelties of the Evolute ProPlus platform. Uh, it has been uh, recently CE mark, very recently CE mark. Uh, so most of the experience uh, resides in, uh, in the US so far. So uh, maybe I, I could uh, start with you, uh, Azim, because you, are, you have uh, experience with the, that platform. And um, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, one uh, question from the, uh, the audience. Uh, it's about the uh, additional uh, wrap that has been uh, added to the uh, 34. Uh, is there a price to pay in terms of risk of uh, uh, coronary obstruction? Because we are aiming extremely high now, we've, and we're going to see that uh, potentially uh, during the recorded case. We are aiming higher and higher. Uh, that wrap that is uh, now um, available for all four valve sizes, does it impact uh, the risk of coronary obstruction? Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, in my experience, I don't think you know the risk of coronary obstruction has been increased by that wrap because remember the wraps on the outside it's covering it's covering an area we had already, right? So we're not seeing increased obstruction because of the wrap. I mean, I do think you know as we go higher and higher, obviously doing your analysis and the CT analysis and looking at coronaries becomes very important because there will be maybe a small subset of patients where you don't want to be too high and you want to make 
the best use of the constraint part of uh, of a Medtronic core valve. Um, but certainly no issues with the wrap, and we've not seen any higher risks of coronary obstruction or even you know malposition of the valve since using ProPlus. Thank you, Azim. Very, uh, very clear statement. So uh, let me come back to, uh, to you, uh, Dan. Uh, Dan, so uh, you nicely demonstrated the new features of the, uh, the Evolute Pro Plus. So we all have the, uh, the feeling that it's going to enable uh, the treatment of a larger group of patients. More patients are going to benefit from a, a transfemoral procedure. So do you think that, uh, that there could be specific subgroups that could benefit f first from the uh, improved profile? And second, uh, from the, the additional wrap on the 34, the larger valve sizes. What do you uh, foresee in terms of additional indications? Yeah, that's a good question, Didier. I mean, I think if we take the wrap first, um, I think, you know, it, we could probably all agree that in larger anatomies are frequently often accompanied by more hostile anatomy in terms of calcification, uh, particularly when we get into bicuspid valves, which frequently have larger annuluses. Um, and we're looking at treating them with the larger size devices. So I think that's certainly a group, the large um, annulus bicuspid patients where the RAP will provide extra benefit. And I think, you know, I was a little bit skeptical about the RAP at first because um, it is just one single pericardial layer. But, I, you know, I, I'm pretty convinced now that we've seen an improvement. Uh, you know, in our own UK national registry data, we showed moderate PVL uh, halved uh, in two successive registries, one with R and then one with PRO. So I think we are going to benefit from uh, from less PVL, and it's those large uh, annuli, and especially, I think, the bicuspids. In terms of the access size, I showed that you can probably treat about 10% more patients um, with the 16, with the 14 French system that um, the, 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 the previously you couldn't treat with the 16 French pro. Uh, so that means more patients. But if you look at vascular access complications, you know, plenty of data has shown there's a relationship between the ratio of the vessel size and the caliber size of the system that you're introducing. So if we reduce the caliber size, Whatever size the vessel is, we should be reducing vascular complications. And of course, we all know that vascular complications are stored by far the most common complications of TAVI. Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, maybe we can move forward and uh, directly dive into the core of the subject and through the, the recorded case. And uh, so Azim, we are looking forward to hearing which type of patient you are going to, uh, uh, to present today. Hello, everybody. My name is Azim Latib from Montefiore Medical Center in New York. And it's my pleasure to present today this recorded case of an Evolu Pro Plus on behalf of my colleagues here at Monte. This is our patient. She is an 88 year old female with a previous medical history of spinal stenosis, uh, some obesity, osteoarthritis, hyperlipidemia and hypertension, who presents now with severe aortic stenosis uh, her main symptoms are dyspnea and exertion, and as well as orthostatic dizziness and orthopnea. She's an NYHA3. As you can see from her medical history, she really doesn't have much uh, as far as comorbidities or important risk factors. We called her intermediate risk based on her age, but you know she may even qualify as being really low risk. A transthoracic echo shows an ejection fraction of 65%, a mean gradient was 36, peak 64, and an aortic valve area of 0.7. We did a coronary angiogram, which showed non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, her renal function is normal with a GFR of 61. And if you look at her ECG, she has normal sinus rhythm, a PR interval of 158, and a QRS of 76 milliseconds. So the, this is her CT evaluation which shows, um, if we look at her annulus, she has a perimeter of 68.5, which gives you a perimeter-derived diameter of 21.8, a mean diameter based on minimum and maximum diameter of 21.4, and her area of the annulus is 368.8. Alveo T gets slightly smaller. If you look then at a sinotubular junction, uh, about 26 millimeters, her sinuses of, El of El Salva are large, uh, they 27 to 29 millimeters. A coronary ostia also at an acceptable height, 13.5 for the left and 15.5 for the right. When you look at her right and left iliofemoral axis, she really has good MLDs uh, bilaterally. So you could really use either the right or left axis 
for Tava. So according to this evaluation, uh, we thought she's a good candidate for a 26 millimeter Avolute Pro Plus transcatheter valve. Um, we we're going to use her right femoral artery for valve delivery, her left atrial artery for pigtail uh, and aortography, and, and body protection with a sentinel device was employed during the case. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Welcome to Montefiore Medical Center uh, and the Structural Heart Team here. Um, it's a pleasure to have you join us for this transfemoral TAVA today with a core valve Evolu Pro Plus. Uh, let me, I'm Azim Latib. Uh, on my left is May Chow, who is my surgical partner and the first operator in this procedure. Jesus Montezino is our tech. And then we have a great support team, um, Stephanie, Shireen, and Jalissa who are supporting us, and Liz, our anesthesiologist, who's helping us for this case today. So now, we've got our protection in place. Um, we need to do a cardiac cath on this patient, too. Liz left Jackins? Okay. I mean, we're gonna swap very briefly as we do a left heart cath. This patient's coronaries looked fine on the CAT scan, um, but I mean, we didn't see lots of calcium or anything, but at the same time, it did, we did need to document that she had no coronary disease. Can you go up to 22, please? Thank you so much. Okay, great. Okay, good. So this is a JL4, right? JL4. So essentially, if we then afterwards have time to cat this patient again, we should use one size smaller because this fits really perfectly. Okay. Okay? Perfect. And really, we just got to confirm what we saw in CAT scan. Flush. But, you know, there's really no significant disease. Okay, great. Okay, fill up your catheter, please. Okay, great. Ready? Okay. So very short left main, almost two separate osteo for the circumflex and LED. It looks like it could be a dominant circ. Okay. But I really do not see anything significant. Let's just look at the LED better. Really nothing, and it looks like it's either dominant, co-dominant. You see a PDA there. Okay, I think that's all we really need. Huh? What do you think? Yeah. Okay, a little puff, please. Okay, so it's a really small RCA. We'll take one picture of this, but I think, you know, this is an RCA that we don't need to look at afterwards again if we decide to just show what coronary access looks like. It's really a non-dominant RCA yeah? and very small, so. Okay, great. Okay, so let's do a baseline aortogram in our co-plane of view, and then we'll get another one uh, in a moment, in our other view. Um, so that looks like a pretty good view. 22, big enough? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, ready? Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. I think it's going to be a beautiful view. Okay, so nice coplanar view. You see the calcification They're in the center, predominantly on the right coronary cusp. So now we'll exchange out the sheath, and we're gonna go with our Evolu Pro. Press, Pro Plus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So really importantly here, uh, 
Jesus is going to show you how he's holding it at the back. Remember, we now no longer hold it with a flash port. Point to the flash port, Jesus. Uh, facing 12 o'clock. How do we, oh, before we talk, go in like this, right? Now we go in with a flash port to the side at 3 o'clock. And I'll show you that when we get in, this is what allows us and helps us with commercial alignment and to get that commissure away from the left main. Okay. Good, I've got wire. Is it going in easily, May? Okay, good. So, what we're going to do is once May comes up to a little higher on the descending order before crossing the arch, we're just going to mag up a bit here and look at our hat marker. I'm going to go into LAO view, so it's best to go into LAO view here. Laura? So, I'm just going to rotate a bit to see where our hat marker is. And you can see the hat marker there. Let me just rotate so you can see this. Okay. Okay, you can see the hat mark is on the outer curve of the aorta. And so that's, it's going to stop flooring now, thank you. Um, and if it stays, if it's an outer curve now on the right of the picture, when we go around the arch, it's going to end up on the outer curve of the aorta, which is where we want it to be. Remember the hat marker is 90 degrees to where the C tab is, and this will hopefully get the C tab to be facing us and see us. Okay, so we can see the C and the C tab and keep the commissure away from the left main. Okay, so I'm gonna go into slightly smaller projection. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay, and we'll cross the arch here in our LAO view. Okay, yeah. Great, so you have to usually pull a little bit on the wire at this stage. Just to help they come around. Okay, stop there. Let's mag up again. Laura. And you can see our hat markers on the outside. That's exactly where we want it to be. Okay. So lots of uh, information uh, provided here. And uh, uh, so maybe Tanya, uh, what are, do you have any concern or uh, any point of discussion that you would like to raise for this uh, patient? I haven't seen the patient presentation and the first steps of the procedure. Yeah, I just want to thank Asim for this great case so far. I think it's a perfect candidate for a transfemoral uh, tarver uh, receiving an evolute uh, regarding the small annulus. And um, I think you showed very nicely the steps so far we should keep in mind uh, when we are using uh, the Evolute Pro system, uh, especially in regard uh, to coronary access. So my question would be in how, what percentage of cases would you think that it actually really works when you turn um, the flush port to three o'clock outside the patient and you in the end you really end up at the correct position with the head on the outer curve? So what is your experience here? Yeah, I must admit we've started doing it routinely now, um, Tanya. Um, we keep it on the outer curve um, and we make sure it stays on the outer curve. I, I guess in most cases, um, you know, we've been very happy. We, you can see the actual C tab, and as long as you're seeing the C tab, it probably means that your commissure is away from the left main. Um, it's rare. I have to be very honest that it's rare that I pull the valve back and start rotating and do it again, unless I'm dealing with a specific case. So if I'm doing a challenging valve in valve or small annulus with low coronaries, I really make more of an effort then. So if I see the, the head mark is not on the outer curve, I'll come back into the descending aorta, rotate it, try and get it on the outer curve again and do that again. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I have to admit that when you see the CTAM, you actually can see it and you try and cannulate the coronaries, it's not that difficult. It just makes it a little bit easier. I absolutely agree. So I think this would be my question at the moment, and I think we should uh, go on with the case. Okay, so let's resume the, the video. Thank you. Okay, stop there. So you see, I think the best thing with this is to really try and keep it as neutral as possible and let the valve do the work of going dropping down. Okay, so I like that again. We can do a little cine here with a little puff again. A little puff. Good. 
I like that. What do you guys think? Yes. Okay. Okay, there's a little forward pressure there. Okay, not too much though. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that is gonna go down. Pace, please. Maybe even a 140, please. Yeah. Yeah. Keep forward pressure, mate. Okay, stop pacing. Keep it forward pressure. Mm -hmm. Here's these big atopic beats, huh? Okay. So that's looking pretty good. It stayed where we wanted it to in relation to that big tail. Let's move forward pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so let's do that just down. So let's do a little autogram here, and then we'll go into an LAO view and to our co-planer view. Okay, go ahead. Ready? Yeah. Well puff. Good, looks good. Stop there. I really like that. You can see, you know, we're fine on the non, we're a little lower on the left, which is Kind of what we expect. Let's go to our coplanar view and then maybe we'll go to an LAO as well. Okay, let's have a look here. Okay, we'll do a little puff here again, since this is what teaching. A little puff, stop there. I really like this, guys. And it just shows you, you know, as someone who's a late adopter for the Cusp overlap, I think this shows you how you can get fooled in other projections because you can end up you know, being too low and this stops you from being too low. I'm just gonna go to LAO 20. But I think this is the view we'll release in, which is the coplanar view. Floral. So you see, I think we're fine on both. Let's go back to our coplanar. So blood pressure is okay. What does everybody think? Yeah, are we happy to release? Okay, so floral. What we're gonna do is I'm going to, May's gonna just hold a little forward pressure, but I already like it because you see the delivery system is in the center of the aorta. Okay. Flora, I'm gonna pull back on the wire so there's nothing pushing the valve up as we release, okay? And we slowly release, we really take our time here. Especially in a patient that is having lots of ectopic beats. Okay, so it released the one tab. Still gonna release the other one. There we go. Let's stop there. Save floral. So they both released. Okay, and the valve stayed very, very stable. Okay. Okay, great. Now look at the C mark, the hat mark. I mean, sorry, the, the commercial tab, the C mark. You can actually see a C. Okay. Uh, what's it called? C tab? C tab. C tab. You can see a C which kind of would suggest that we far away from the left main uh, and that there's no commissure in front of the left main. So I think, you know, we achieved the two things we wanted to do here. We did a pretty high implantation. Uh, let's see what the result is. And we got, we did commercial alignment to get that C-tab away from where the left main is. Let's take this out and put our 16 French, 14 French sheath in. Okay. That way we can go back and do another coronary angiogram uh, at the end. Okay. Okay, so let's look at echo now. I can stop floor. Yeah, it's really great position. There you are. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not seeing any PVL2 on this view on this peristernal long. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to admit there, you know, a lot of centers now that are not doing uh, trans thoracic echo at the end of the procedure, they're just making their decisions based on fluoroscopy. Uh, we still believe really strongly that you need all the modalities to evaluate patients because we really want to give our patients the best results possible. I mean, this is a patient who is essentially, you know, even though elderly, low risk, and Dr. Chow wouldn't accept from me, you know, from us a suboptimal result. So I think we learn more when we do TE, don't you think? Ils ont l'air un peu perplexes eux aussi.
Ouais. Euh... Ok, vas-y. C'est euh, euh, Azim. Donc, Azim. Mais... Looks really good, yeah. Yeah, it looks really good. As you can see, I think we may have lost the audio, but you know, you can see the five chamber view and three chamber view. I'm really not seeing any PVL, uh, really no indication to post dilate. We use, like I said earlier, we use trans thoracic echo all the time in these cases. Um, we evaluate our gradients um, at the end of the procedure as well, just to have a echo gradient that we can then compare uh, at discharge um, when the patient's moving around a lot more and then at follow up. Um, so in a second, I think we can show you an autogram too. Um, so uh, we'll do a final autogram. And you know, in this case, we really wanted to show the advantages of commercial alignment and how even though we have a tall valve, it doesn't impact um, in, in a big way, coronary excess, uh, particularly if you optimize commercial alignment. So we'll give you an autogram now to really have a sense of what the result looks like um, as well. So here you see the autogram. I think you see a couple of things. Really good position of the valve, high implantation. Uh, you can see both coronaries and good coronary flow. I really don't see any PVL on on aortography either. Um, and then just, you know, I always try and look at around everything. Uh, the aorta as well looks good. I'm not seeing any issues there. So it looks like a really great result, uh, really maximizing the commercial alignment um, and using cusp overlap to get a high implant. And with Pro Plus and these techniques, we really have seen an improvement in PVL. So if this is a low risk patient. I really wanted to demonstrate here that you know, getting coronary excess is not a challenge. So we decided to recannulate the left coronary live to show you. So this is live. Um, I often like to go with the wire, goes through the valve into the ventricle to be shown inside the valve um, before this really confirms that I'm within, I'm within the core valve, right? I think this is a good trick to use in the future. Then pull the wire back. Uh, and just watch the timer, how long it takes us to cannulate this, this coronary. So it's one attempt. Uh, I use the Jackson's 3.5, so slightly smaller than I, what I would have used if there was no valve in front of me. So pulling back a little bit of clockwise, counterclockwise rotation uh, to watch the, the really tip go through the valve strut. And there you see it pop through the valve strut and we're in the coronary. I mean, that took literally 20 seconds to do. Um, and this is why I think it makes, you know, the extra effort of doing uh, commercial alignment is, is beneficial. Um, we're always going to have to get through the struts, but if we can at least keep the commercial away, it makes uh, access that much easier. So we, did, we don't obviously routinely recannulate the coronaries. We're just doing this uh, to demonstrate it, added only five cc's to the procedure. Azim, I just support your point on uh, trans thoracic echo. I mean, we seem to have gone full circle. We started off with people only doing echo and not doing aortograms, and now we've got people doing only aortograms and not echo. And there's valuable information from echo, from the aortogram, and from the hemodynamics. So we will always assess all three and get as much information as we can to get an optimal result. And I think as I, as I recall, you said, if we had the audio from the tape, the other reason you need the echo, of course, is if anything happens, if we get sudden hypotension, and you can pretty quickly demonstrate what's going on and whether there's any concerning complication that needs addressing immediately. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what we do is we actually do a base. We always do an echo before starting the procedure. It just, it kind of also just helps you with when you look at the valve and you look at the ventricle at the end, understanding, you know, is this a patient with a small ventricle? Are they going to need fluids at the end of the procedure to expand that ventricle? Um, you see that small pericardial effusion the patient already has that's chronic and you don't freak out at the end of the procedure because you see a small pericardial effusion, right? So it just helps with all of that. And by having it in the room all the time, 
when there's a complication, when there's sudden hypotension, it's not like somebody's looking for where the echo machine is. It's right there, it's on, you just grab the probe, and within seconds, you can exclude some of the important complications. So thank you uh, very much, Azim. So uh, that was an outstanding case, and I definitely believe that it uh, nicely uh, demonstrates the features of the, the platform and the benefits, because this was a challenging patient. So there are several points of discussion that we may have here, but let me start first with the anatomy of the patient, because this is a challenging anatomy because it's a small analyst. So uh, do you believe that, or do you think that there is an advantage of such a platform in uh, such a small anatomy? Because the smaller the, the anatomy is, there are certain complications that you may develop for us. And so potentially uh, some platforms may be more suited to small annually rather than the other ones. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, absolutely. So. Certainly in my practice, I'm a strong believer in using supraannular valves in small anatomies. I don't like very small intraannular valves, so I don't implant 20 millimeter valves in my patients. Um, I think I may have done once in my career so far, I try and avoid that. Uh, and I try and give somebody a bigger, as big a valve as possible. You know, the one issue you have to take into account when dealing with small annuli is the fact that if, you, if it's a small annulus, it's a small anatomy, they have smaller sinuses, and so you need to think about coronaries as well. And while we're always trying to go higher and higher, you know, some of these patients, you may not be able to get as high as you like because of coronaries. So that's the only thing, the downside, you know, or the other side of the coin to take into consideration with small, with small anatomies. So very clear. So I would like to, uh, to address uh, one of the questions from the, uh, the audience because there uh, you nicely demonstrated the new features and put, uh, particularly the wrap and for the larger valve sizes. And one of the questions from uh, our friends from the, uh, the audience uh, is about the ability the potential for even higher, uh, uh, impl higher implants as compared to what we, uh, we are used to do uh, with the, the contemporary, uh, uh, the last iteration. Uh, so uh, Dan, do you think that with this new iteration of the Proplus, with the technique uh, that has been demonstrated by Azim, we could aim higher or is it a little bit dangerous, harmful for the patient? What is your opinion on that? Yeah, I don't think the addition of the wrap DDA makes a difference to um, how high we go. They're separate but complementary uh, features of the Evolu Pro Plus system. The reason we're going higher is to try and primarily to reduce pacemaker rate. And it's worth keeping that in mind. And we haven't touched on measuring the membrane septum, but that's always useful. And probably most useful, I think, when you find those patients with a long membrane septum, and then you don't necessarily need to go as high. If the membrane septum is six millimeters, then you can be looking at, um, you know, not, not feeling focused on a high implant. Implanting high in general is definitely the right way to go. Don't get me wrong on that. I think, you know, it primarily reduces pacemaker rate. It also increases mm -hmm. the diameter of the frame at the level of the annulus and therefore increases the radial force and therefore will also contribute to the reduction in paravalvular leak. Set against that, you know, as Azim said, we've got to think about coronary access, especially in small anatomy. And when we move into younger patients, we've got to think about TAVI and TAVI for the future as well. And we know that the patients that are going to be hardest to treat with a system like the Evolute in the future are those who have a low and small STJ. And if we implant mm. higher in those patients, we may create problems for ourselves in the future. So we've got to focus now increasingly as we move into TAVI and younger patients about the next procedure as well. Um, and making sure that we're leaving ourselves room both to reaccess the coronaries, but also to perform TAVI and TAVI in younger patients with longer life expectancies. So it's, uh, uh, let me bounce on that, the last part of the, uh, your question, your comment, because you are you're, uh, discussing the issue of younger uh, patients with lower risk uh, profile, and we all are, have started to treat lower risk patients. And so, uh, Tanya, this is a, a question for, for you. Uh, do you think that the... Uh, Hemodynamics uh, plays a role in the decision making uh, for a low risk patient, given the uh, younger age and uh, the longer life expectancy. Do we have to focus on the hemodynamics, or do you think that this is not a, this, sh this should not be the core of the uh, the decision? I definitely think that the hemodynamics uh, is. is they are very important and um, no matter how old the patient is or what the risk of the patient is, we should always try to shoot for the best hemodynamics. But of course, 
um, if the hemodynamics uh, are not perfect, uh, there might be um, accelerated degeneration of the prosthesis. Um, we definitely should avoid patient, patient prosthesis mismatch since it has been shown in surgical patients that this is an accelerating factor for valve degeneration. And it's it's very likely that we see the same in, in, in TAVI prosthesis. So um, I definitely think that in a small anatomy, um, it's even more important um, to be careful in selecting the right um, um, TABI prosthesis for the patient and to make sure that we have a perfect uh, hemodynamic at the end of the procedure and also during the follow-up. So thank you very much for that. So uh, Azim, uh, once again, if we, uh, we try to address the, the, the concerns from the audience, um, you nicely demonstrated how to... Uh, understand the position, the location of the heart marker to uh, try to figure out if you have a proper commissural alignment or not. Could you uh, once again explain mm -hmm. that for us and for the audience? What should be the appearance of the heart marker in both the HALO and the RAO projection? And the second part of the, the concern, the second type of concern is about do you, um, do you try to uh, align that uh, as a position of the heart marker with the orientations of the coronary of a specific patient because there is a wide variety of the, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the angles? And do you try to adapt to that or do you, you always put the flush pot at three o'clock for every single patient? Yeah, the, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, certainly in my practice, I try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, I think in the future, we probably will learn more as we learn more about commercial alignment. We may get patient specific commercial alignment. Um, there's a lot of work happening with that. I don't think we're there yet. So I keep it pretty simple. I, I just try and make sure that as much as possible, my the hat marker is on the outer curve when I'm in an LAO projection, <clears throat> because remember in the LAO projection, that's when you're really gonna have the left main on the opposite side. And generally, if I can see the head marker on the LAO projection, I'm happy. And that's where I'm gonna implant the valve. Now, <clears throat> there are ways to look at it as well in your cusp overlap view, but I, I, I honestly try to keep it as simple as possible in my practice. Okay. And so uh, if we, um, uh, we uh, come back, what we do try- What by the way? Yeah. I do. I do the same. I do the same. So uh, keeping the flush pot at free. There is only one uh, type of situation in which I modify the technique. It's for bike speed patients. For bike speed patients with uh, a fusion between, uh, for example, the right and the non-coronary cusp, the 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 location of the rafe is going to be different. So in that situation, I used to. Uh, put the flush pot between six and nine o'clock just to try to, uh, to get a different position of the heart marker and the C-tab at the end of the procedure uh, to, uh, to keep the coronary osteoms free. So is, this is still work in progress, but it's, uh, uh, I like your advice of keeping it simple and keeping the flush pot at three o'clock. For the vast majority of the patient, it's going to match that commissural uh, uh, to um, uh, get a, a proper commissural uh, alignment. If we... Uh, Come back before uh, your lecture, Tanya, about the cusp overlap and the benefits of the, the cusp overlap. If we go a little bit more into details about the steps of that cusp overlap technique, uh, would you uh, refresh for us, uh, Azim, what are the, the steps? Where do you place the, uh, the, the ring of the capsule at the start? And what are the key steps for the audience, just to make it clearer? Right. So, I mean, generally now, you know, you will... Um, advance your valve, um, the, the core valve, across the native valve in the cusp overlap view. The cusp overlap view, as you know, is generally in an RAO oblique, uh, RAO caudal view. And even for those of you, and I, and I honestly mean this, I'm a late adopter of this, so <laughs> I'm learning to you, uh, the, you know, uh, on how to do this. And the reason I've, I like it is because, you know, compared to the old view, old technique we did, in the cusp overlap view, it's the view that gives you your alignment on the valve plus the alignment on the core valve. So you see the bottom of the, the marker of the core valve in a straight line. And that's what makes this view so powerful, I think. I then, I used a um, Safari wire, as you mm -hmm. saw in most cases. There are other centers that prefer using stiffer wires. I prefer the Safari wire, pre-shaped wire, or any other pre-shaped wire, because I'm very concerned about uh, annular rupture. So I bring the valve across. Uh, I have my pigtail in the non-coronary cusp, 
and I have the bottom of the delivery system just above the pigtail. Because what you're doing is, as you're releasing the valve, we all used to complain about the fact that core valve moves forward. Right now, we actually use that to our advantage. We stay a little above the annulus and allow the core valve to move forward to engage the annulus. So by staying slightly above, just above the pigtail, when it opens up, it actually lands then on the annulus. I, when I see both sides opening and starting to engage the other end of the annulus, so the right coronary and left coronary cast side, I pace uh, at 120 to 140, depending on the patient. I then go a little faster until I go to you know, just about 80%, the point of no return. At that point, you then go into an LAO view and try and get rid of all the parallax on the valve and then do another um, aorto aortogram in that view to make sure that the left coronary cusp side is not too low. If I like it in both these views, at that stage, I do a slow release of the valve. Perfect. Crystal clear. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, one uh, question uh, for you, uh, Dan. Uh, we've seen that Azim uh, uh, tried to uh, and did succeed in cannulating the left coronary artery post procedure. Uh, you, you did that, uh, Azim, for the, the sake of the, the recorded case and for teaching purposes. But Dan, don't you believe that this could be a routine practice because we are treating a lot uh, a greater number of, uh, of patients, and some of them are going to return in non-TAVI centers for, for example, an acute myocardial infarction. So isn't it a piece, an additional piece of information if we, at baseline, uh, try to uh, uh, illustrate where to cannulate, what is the projection, which guide, uh, diagnostic or guiding after we have utilized? Do you think that this could be systematic and more systematic in the, uh, in the future just to have the, these non-TAVI uh, implanters? DDA, it's rare that I disagree with you, but I think I am going to on this occasion. I, I'm not sure I could support doing that routinely. Um, it'd be unlikely that information would filter through to whoever the patient pitched up in front of in the middle of the night with a STEMI. Um, so I think we should vote, you know, I think we should try and align the commissures in every case. And we've got a good mechanism for doing it now, but I'm not sure we need to demonstrate how to cannulate the coronaries because there's always some risk associated with, it is tiny of course, but, um, but I don't think you'll have operators wanting to do that routinely um, after they've done the procedure. I think we should focus on the commissure alignment. And I think it's been a big step forward. Um, and we all know that it can be difficult to cannulate uh, uh, the coronaries with core valve evolute platform. I think we've all probably had cases where patients have been uh, turned up in district hospitals, surround peripheral hospitals, and they haven't been able to cannulate the coronaries. And Tavi says, as, as Tavi implanters, we've learned tr uh, tips and tricks on floating the wire in, following up with guide catheter extensions, etc. But I think this is a big step forward to make it easier to get in the coronaries with the Evolute platform. And of course, you know, to come back to the issue of uh, Tavi and Tavi in the future. Um, that's going to be a lot more feasible with less risk of jailing the, uh, the coronaries if we've aligned the commissures at the primary procedure. Words of wisdom. Uh, so, uh, Tanya, uh, uh, it's time to, uh, to move to your lecture and you're going to drive us through the benefits of the cusp overlap uh, techniques uh, in terms of uh, outcomes. So, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. These are my disclosures. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may appreciate from this slide, with the cusp overlap technique, we are able to elongate the LVOT, in particular as compared to the three cusp co planar view and the LAO view. This facilitates an accurate positioning of the TAVI prosthesis, in particular in regard to the non coronary cusp, as shown here uh, on the left hand side. In order to reduce the interaction with the conduction system, we should try to attempt an implantation depth not lower than three millimeters into the LVOT. We should also try to start deployment at mid pigtail, so the valve should travel into the aortic annulus during deployment. Various smaller, mainly monocentric studies have shown that the cusp overlap technique significantly reduces the permanent pacemaker implantation rate. However, so far there is no multi-center study on this topic. 
the optimized PRO study um, has the objective to collect clinical evidence on valve performance and procedural outcomes utilizing CUSP overlap technique to deploy Evolute valves. I would like to share with you within the next few minutes the pre-specified interim analysis. The mean age of patients in the optimized PRO uh, study was 78%. And what you see, there was a roll-in phase where the centers were trained on the technique and then um, patient went to the main cohort. And I basically will focus on the combined result. This was an overall low-risk uh, patient cohort uh, having an SDS score of 2.9. And there was already in 6% of the patients a pre-existing right bundle branch block, the main risk factor for permanent pacemaker implantation. Uh, All-cause mortality and stroke was low with being 5% in the combined patient cohort. There was no mortality, but only 5% um, of patients um, had a non-disabling stroke. Permanent pacemaker implantation rate was 8.8%. In summary, from the optimized PRO study, we learned that with the CUSP overlap technique, we are able to achieve excellent clinical outcomes. We can also achieve really low permanent pacemaker implantation rates. Hemodynamics are, as always, excellent with the Evolute prosthesis with a mean gradient of 8 and low PVL rate. There were no pop-outs, even though a high implantation position was being tried to achieve. And from the TBT registry and also from various other studies, um, we get a reconfirmation that um, CUSP overlap technique significantly reduces the permanent pacemaker implantation rate. Thank you for your attention. So Tanya, that was a very nice uh, overview of the uh, potential benefits of the uh, uh, CUSP overlap uh, t technique and the ProPlus uh, platform because uh, in the, the Optimize Pro, it was mainly the vast majority of the patients were treated with a ProPlus platform. Even though this is uh, an interim analysis, uh, we, one could expect that the outcomes could have been uh, exceptional as they are only for pacemaker rates and uh, for uh, conduction disturbances uh, overall. But what we see is that even the clinical, the more uh, uh, dreadful uh, clinical outcomes like stroke, deaths and so on, are really, really decreased. And what, what is the, the explanation to your opinion? What does add the technique to uh, the prevention of such complications like, like stroke? Well, I'm pretty sure um, that we learned a lot during the last decade uh, regarding our implantation technique. Um, and so, I mean, we see that in, in different registries and also in, in, in our randomized trials that the stroke rate and also mortality is going dramatically down. Um, I mean, of course, this was a cohort having a low risk, mm. even though the age was at the end uh, 70s. But I think this is what we just would expect um, from um, a very good uh, TAVI platform, that this is the numbers we are getting. Um, and I think what was really um, confirming here is that the hemodynamics were so good. So, I mean, um, mild or trace PVL was achieved in 80% of the patients and only 20% had uh, mild PVL. There were no patients with moderate to severe. So this is a, a big step forward um, also in, in, in hemodynamics. And I think this just shows that if we achieve for a high implantation position, this also helps to reduce uh, PVL. And this is uh, definitely the type of uh, outcomes that we expect uh, for uh, lower risk patients uh, to, to get uh, exceptional hemodynamics and to get uh, uh, low pacemaker rates, early discharge, so definitely uh, it matches the expectations for lower risk patients. So Azim, uh, maybe one last question from the, the chat. Uh, what about the anti-thrombotic uh, uh, regimen for the patient? Yeah, um, I think, you know, based on popular TAVI now, uh, we are only giving our patients aspirin post -tavi. Um That's what we do. Uh, if they require anticoagulation, then 
for another reason and they only get anticoagulation. So we've stopped using DAPT in our patients as routine. Excellent. Uh, so um, I think it's, uh, it's time to uh, kind of wrap up. And it was, I have to say that it's, this was a very uh, stimulating discussion uh, because Evolute Pro Plus is just coming, uh, uh, has just co come to Europe and we are learning more about the, uh, the benefits of this platform. And uh, we nicely uh, had the, an overview of the new features of the, uh, the, the platform first with the improvement in the delivery profile allowing, as Dan has mentioned, to treat more patients with uh, smaller vessels, uh, as it was the case uh, before with the past iteration of the uh, Evolute R. We are now able to treat more patients with an, an, a, a, a suited platform. And then we have that wrap for the 34 millimeter, so we are going to be able to treat even more challenging anatomies like, for example, biker speed, uh, biker speed uh, uh, patients, patients with large anatomy with uh, a minimal risk of uh, a perivalvular uh, Regurgitation. Uh, then we've seen and we had a, a, a superb case and uh, the audience congratulated uh, you uh, Azim for uh, the, uh, the outcome for the patient and you nicely demonstrated a contemporary technique combining the cusp of a lab technique and the commercial alignments. We had that step-by-step -step, uh, procedure description of of how to achieve a proper commercial alignment in the cusp of live view. And so we had that, the objective was match. And at last, we, uh, we could understand through the, uh, the presentation of the interim uh, results, interim analysis results of the optimized probe uh, uh, study of what we could expect in terms of outcomes for lower risk patients in terms of hemodynamics, clinical outcomes uh, such as stroke, death, PVLIC uh, reduction and early discharge because uh, lower risk patients, younger ones are going to be more mobile and we need to uh, take the quality of life into uh, consideration. So uh, having said that, I'd like to, uh, to thank you all, uh, for, all uh, for participating, for providing such good lectures and, and cases, Azim, Tanya and Dan. Thank, uh, I would like to thank Medtronic uh, for uh, uh, supporting that TNT and thank the audience for uh, the quality of the uh, interactivity, uh, the level of the, the questions, and uh, uh, I wish you all a, a nice evening or afternoon, depending on the time zone where you are. Thank you, guys, and see you soon face-to-face. -face. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.